5th, the new National Health Service starts, providing hospital and specialist services, medicines, drugs and appliances, care of the teeth and eyes, and maternity services. Have you chosen your family doctor? I was delivered on the early morning of Sunday the 27th of June 1948, and on the 5th of July 1948, the National Health Service was uh, started by and you're in Bevan, that is instruction. And so my parents got a bill for the nine days that I was in the Canadian Red Cross Maternity Hospital, but not for the last few days that she stayed there. On July the 5th, 2013, the National Health Service celebrates its 65th birthday. And although the first anaesthetic was given in 1846, the specialty of anaesthesia is widely regarded as being the same age as the NHS itself. You see, all anaesthetics are, uh, apart from a few in university hospitals in this country, were given by uh, general practitioners as a sideline. A lot of the people who went into military service during the war and who worked in field hospitals were pushed into anaesthesia, not knowing any more about it than I did when I was a house surgeon, but they found they enjoyed it. And when they came out, they wanted to go on with it. And the great change when the NHS comes to an end was they paid all the hospital doctors. And this, I think, is what the NHS provided. And perhaps as people haven't realised that the contribution it made to, to anaesthesia by providing jobs for people who were keen to do them the big debate in the turnover was whether anaesthetists would be eligible to be made consultants. The health service started, as it must inevitably do, I think, in any part of the world, in an atmosphere of friction, of controversy, of doubt, and of great hopes. When the NHS started, they were only prepared to make consultant status available to physicians, surgeons, obstetricians and gynaecologists because those were the three royal colleges. Nobody else was going to be a consultant. They approached the RCS and said, would you be prepared to set up a faculty of anaesthetists? And the result was the rather rapid setting up of the faculty and a rather rapid establishment of upgrading the diploma to fellowship standard, a two-part fellowship standard. And once we'd established that we were academically able to provide that sort of background, then the NHS agreed that uh, ultimately anaesthetists could hold consultant status. We had to earn the um, status that we got as a fully recognised specialty, we had to earn it. I mean, it wasn't going to come for nothing. And it was quite hard to earn it. I think, I think, that, 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 I think the scientific development was very important. I think the development of basic sciences and of academic departments of anaesthesia were, were terribly important. In the late 1940s, at the inception of the NHS, many drugs, agents and techniques were still in widespread use, although they'd been developed in the 19th century and would have been familiar to most Victorian anaesthetists. The amount of training you had was negligible. And I myself can produce for you here a certificate to show that on qualification as MB, I had administered one anaesthetic. That gives you an idea of uh, the amount of training we had in those days. So on day one, I, I collected the keys for this ambulance. I was very relieved to see in the front passenger seat uh, an experienced obstetrician. And in the back were uh, a couple of bottles of plasma and two suitcases. One was marked anaesthesia and the other obstetrics. And my role was really quite modest. I used to accompany this fellow into the each house and sit and take notes and say nothing until one day he uh, things weren't looking good, and he said, um, this patient needs an anaesthetic. So um, I said, uh, optimistically, shall I phone up and try? He answered me with the, with the words I didn't want to hear. He said, you are the anaesthetist. So I tried to explain, without frightening the patients, that I had never given an anaesthetic in my entire life. Um, he ignored this and handed me a bottle of chloroform and some um, 
gauze and said, uh, well, a Schimmelbus mask it was, as I later, he said, just pour this onto here until I tell you to stop. So it was very alarming because the uh, patient went blue and um, he went white and I was decidedly yellow. So it was a most bizarre uh, and terrifying experience. The mask is a Schimmelbusch or other standard design. It has a spring band to hold the gauze in position. The gauze has been folded into 10 or 12 thicknesses. It's clipped into position over the mask. But my entry into anaesthesia was to be sent to a flying station down in the Suez Canal. When the anaesthetist at this 50 bedded hospital up in the main part of the canal zone went over the handlebars of his bike and smashed both his wrists. And suddenly overnight I found myself anaesthetist to RAF Egypt, which was um, a bit of a shock. It was just an apprenticeship. You watched a few people giving anaesthetics, and they were mostly not specialists, they were mostly GP anaesthetists, certainly outside London, and you just sort of learnt by experience. Well, in, I, sh I suppose all the hospitals that I went to, there was no formal training for anaesthetists. Uh, there was absolutely, nobody seemed to be very interested in teaching you. Cecil Gray and his school, arranged so that SHOs at all the district general hospitals would be freed up to come to the lectures uh, four times a week. We all went to a lecture programme, it was very well organised. I think the pass rate for the part one and the part two was pretty high. As the specialty of anaesthesia became more complicated, it became obvious that it would need to be underpinned by a formalised training programme. Today, the Royal College of Anaesthetists runs a very comprehensive seven-year training programme with two difficult examinations. Ether is relatively safe, and as comparatively few accessories are necessary, it's valuable as a standby when other equipment is lacking. I think, see, open ether was a very safe anaesthetic. Uh, if the patient stopped breathing, then you stop the ether, and they would breathe again. Yeah, it was very interesting how the agents changed over the years, and I can remember when I first started in Bath, there was a new agent called Halothane, but I was told, don't you touch it. I mean, it's not people like you. This is, people can be taken ill with this anaesthetic. So you just keep giving ether because we, we like it better that way. I must be one of the few people who's used both chloroform and sevoflurin, I think. Um, because, as I say, my first anaesthetic was chloroform. And I was involved in leading the, um, the, the UK's part of the multisensor phase three trials of sevoflurin when they were introduced. In children, uh, Great Home Street was the only hospital in the country that was involved in that trial. So I was one of the first people to use sevoflurin in children in this country. And now, of course, it's, it's used all the time. And it, it immediately replaced cyclopropane for us. The introduction of a drug into widespread clinical practice that allowed more complex and longer operations to be performed. That drug was tubicurare. And with tubicurare, anaesthesia, which had hitherto been regarded as a pure art form, developed into a mixture of art and science. Pride of anaesthesia consisted of sleep, muscle relaxation, and deafferentation. Um, the theory being is that if you were asleep, you could not feel anything. If you couldn't move, you wouldn't move. And if you were deprived of all your senses, there would be no need to move. We at Great Ormond Street tended to give uh, an inhalational induction with cyclopropane, which was a very powerful anaesthetic agent, and then go on to gas oxygen halothane, mostly with spontaneous breathing, unless it was absolutely essential to paralyse the patient, if the, obviously if the surgeon was working inside the abdomen or something. We would use curare and we'd use uh, succinylcholine for intubation. But in Liverpool, under Jackson Rees, and his team, they were using the Liverpool technique, which was nitrous oxide, oxygen and, and curare for virtually everything. Professor Cecil Gray from Liverpool uh, was perhaps the father of muscle relaxation in the United Kingdom. And he worked with curare and when curare was introduced, it made a tremendous difference to the outcome of patients. And uh, there are quotes from him and Francis Folds from the United States who said that anesthesia was turned simply from an art into a science. <laughs>
it was quickly realized that there were three components to an anesthetic, sleep, pain relief, and muscle relaxation. But with muscle relaxation, patients need assistance with their breathing. And so a whole new art form was developed of artificial ventilation, underpinned by detailed scientific knowledge of physiology. You had to know something about ventilation. We really knew almost nothing about it. And that's why I think that the 50s, 60s and 70s were a huge period of development of research in anaesthesia. I mean, you had, you had professorial, a few professorial chairs set up. Till we learned the basics of applied respiratory physiology, to which a lot of credit must go to John Nunn. He did a lot of work, and Keith Sykes. And they did a lot of work in this area and showed us what physiology of respiration was. I think once we got control of that, uh, it became a lot safer. It is essential that the mother should fully understand how to use the selected apparatus well before she goes into labor. Now anaesthetists found their role extending beyond the operating theater. For instance, giving pain relief in the maternity unit. When I was a trainee, when I started, there was all the obstetrics was done under general anesthesia. That's uh, anesthesia for operative obstetrics, in other words, cesarean sections or complicated forceps deliveries. Pain relief in labor was uh, often either nothing or pethidine, which of course made the, the mother rather sedated and rather out of the scene. So when local anesthesia started to be talked about, particularly in the United States and Canada, I felt I should go and see what was going on. And they were using epidurals for pain relief in labor in selected women. And it was obviously very successful. It obviously really did relieve the pain of labor and left them in a happy, conscious state so they could actually appreciate the childbirth. Well, we, we, had, to, we had to establish epidurals for labor. And that was quite difficult because we had to convince a whole lot of different groups of people, particularly midwives, obstetricians, and of course the, the ladies themselves, that this was a suitable method of pain relief. So, so that was quite a challenge and it took several years really to get that established. In fact, the epidural rate amongst women delivering at the um, maternity hospital was about 45% at that time. So it was sometime during the 1980s that epidurals began to be used for uh, caesarean section uh, without any adjuncts. So certainly at the time I was a junior they were all done under general anaesthesia. Regional anaesthesia has developed in parallel and regional anaesthetics are now used not only in maternity units, but alone in operating theatres or as an adjunct to general anaesthesia. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is it's a whole spectrum. You can have re local anaesthesia without any sedation, without any an other sort of anaesthesia, right through to, to full general anaesthesia. And commonly for more major surgery, not ophthalmic surgery particularly, but say orthopedic surgery, abdominal surgery, it is very common to use a combination of the two. And then people ask the question, well, if you're having a general anaesthetic, why do you need a regional anaesthetic as well? Aren't you just increasing the risks by using two different techniques? And the answer is that there is very good evidence that regional anesthesia, even in conjunction with general anesthesia, does improve the recovery and the rate of discharge from hospital. And the reason it does that, we think, is because the, the pain impulses from the surgical knife don't actually get to the central nervous system because they're blocked at whatever level you're putting in the local anesthetic, then that markedly reduces the body's responses to stress and stress is one of the things that can be measured but by measuring hormones. It is one of the things that tends to prolong recovery. Well, I think propofol has found such an extraordinary place in the development of day case anesthesia. The patients are so much more alert and therefore I think so much safer. Uh, it doesn't have the hangover effect. I spent uh, a long time looking at the existing uh, laboratory evidence uh, and increasingly some in vivo evidence on the molecular 
uh, mechanism of action of propofol. There are many, many receptors that propofol acts on, 30, 40, something of that order. And it was a very happy serendipity that propofol was introduced at the same time as the laryngeal mask because the two go together very well because propofol does suppress those reflexes that if you try and use an LMA with thiopentone, you realise the difference that there is pharmacologically between the two. An arthroscopy became a, a really big um, number of patients on an orthopaedic list. And there was this great dilemma, uh, I seem to think, when I was an anaesthetist, as to how was the best way to anaesthetise them, because we had a face mask or an endotracheal tube. And you felt a face mask sometimes was fine, but they didn't always fit quite as well. And if the arthroscopy went on a little while and you were trying to sort of maintain your airway and do other things, it was a bit problematic. And yet an endotracheal tube seemed a bit sort of over the top for this kind of sort of investigative procedure. And so when the laryngeal mask came along, <laughs> it solved our problems sort of overnight. You can keep your finger on the pulse in the facial artery where it crosses the lower jaw or in the superficial temporal artery in the angle between the upper border of the zygoma and the ear. The monitoring that we had was finger on the pulse, really, and watch the breathing and look for clinical signs. And uh, because there weren't any other devices. I mean, the ECG machine was a huge thing which gave you a paper trace which you'd have to go and look at when you weren't looking at your patient. But basically, a finger on the pulse would tell you um, not only the pulse rate, but the volume of the pulse, so something about the blood pressure, the warmth of the hands, to uh, see whether the patients were losing fluid, they started to get clammy and, and shocked. You'd look at the classical signs of anaesthesia, the eyes and, uh, and the pupils and things like that, the breathing. Um, but it was all done clinically. There, there was ECG monitoring, um, but it was fairly crude. And if the patient moved, the, this bit off the screen for a while. In fact, there was a, an elderly Scottish obstetric anaesthetist who refused to anaesthetise patients with the ECG attached. He thought it was dangerous. And then I think the big changes that came in my early career, uh, I think the big, two biggest changes, I think one was automated non-invasive blood pressure, which is now completely universally used. And the other extraordinary invention really was pulse oximetry allows us to detect low levels of oxygen in patients completely non-invasively. It's universally used. And there's some reasonably good evidence that it's of all the monitoring systems we've introduced, it has saved lives. We only had one capnograph, a machine that measures the amount of carbon dioxide you're breathing out. We had one to share between four theatres in Bristol when I started. It had to be left on overnight, otherwise it stopped working. Uh, and you had to borrow it for big cases if the professor of anaesthesia wasn't using it. <laughs> um, whereas now it's completely universal. Solid state device, you switch the machine on and it goes. Introduction of universal monitoring and the evidence from America showing that these anaesthetic deaths were preventable provided you monitored oxygenation and capnography um, and, and then the minimal standards making it obligatory for hospitals to to buy them for every anaesthetic room and the hospital realising they would be fined punitively if there was an anaesthetic death. Uh, so I think there has been a, a huge increase in both the quality of the monitoring but also the quantity that we use. The role of the anaesthetist was well established and extended beyond the operating theatre and well beyond just putting patients to sleep. Anaesthetists with their detailed knowledge of cardiac, cardiovascular and respiratory physiology became essential in nearly every part of the hospital. I think another thing which, which um, became more and more obvious, um, when you looked at the way hospitals worked, there was very little, as it developed, particularly as intensive care and pain developed, there were very little bits of the hospital that we didn't have our fingers into. I mean, about the only thing I can think of that we didn't have our fingers into at all was dermatology. And anaesthetists, with their ability to look after the breathing in unconscious patients and their expertise in looking after very sick patients were integral to the development of intensive care services. But I think one of the things that I witnessed was the growth and the more widespread use of intensive care throughout hospitals. A lot of the big uh, university hospitals would have intensive care units. But uh, just as an illustration in my training, I was sent off to Sweden for six months 
to pick up extra experience in intensive care, whereas now you would expect anybody training to for it be part of their training no matter where they were. Right then, it was just about making patients survive ventilation and the consequences of man mechanical ventilation. But in the next few years, it became more and more, less and less pulmonary and more and more cardiovascular. And then it changed again and became total body medicine. That sounds very odd. And patients died of, I'll call it a very odd thing, total body failure. We now know what it is, it's the sepsis syndrome and so on and so forth. And so I moved from knowing about pulmonary physiology to knowing about cardiac physiology and its application uh, and to knowing renal medicine and so on and metabolic medicine. So what, what I think we will get is an understanding of why some people do or do not adapt well to hypoxia. And the way that I think that will alter care for patients is, uh, is twofold really. Firstly. Uh, I think we are starting to get to a, uh, if you like, a, a fingerprint of, of what that looks like so that we can identify people early and say, that person's going to be fine. We, we don't need to worry too much about their oxygen level going very low. That person is not. We really need to focus our attention on them, make sure we watch the oxygen level very closely, think about additional interventions. Because the particular physiological challenges that surgery and anaesthesia pose on patients, anaesthetists are perhaps best placed to understand and therefore manage patients' comorbidities prior to surgery. Then during the operation, as techniques both in surgery and in anaesthesia uh, advance, there is more that we can do uh, than one was able to do maybe 10 or 20 years ago to optimise the patient both before, during and then after the surgery. This concept of perioperative medicine, which starts way before the patient enters the hospital for an elective operation and ends probably when they leave it, um, has come out. And I think anaesthetists again have a very important role to play in that in the future. Over the last 65 years since 1948, both the NHS and anaesthesia have changed enormously. Anaesthesia is now the largest single hospital specialty in the UK. And the role of the anaesthetist bears no relation to that in 1948. Who knows what the future holds? But one thing is certain. As perioptive medicine develops, the role of the anaesthetist will change with it. There's no doubt about it that I will allow any surgeon I know to uh, take off my leg if it were necessary or even remove my appendix. But even with the modern appliances and drugs, I should be very careful who I choose to be the anaesthetist. Mm -hmm.